All right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms and homes around the world. We know you guys are stuck at home, so we so appreciate you joining us. We continue to highlight such cool people, especially this week, because this week is Oceans Week. Uh, on Monday, yesterday, uh, June 8th, is Oceans day every single year so oceans events calls to action all across the globe and we are always excited here at exploring by the seat of your pants to blast out with like 20 25 events on a huge slew of amazing topics today we are joined by one of my favorite speakers she has joined us a huge a bevy of times on a, on a great variety of topics over the last few years so galen rosenwax is joining us and Today, she is going to talk about her marine adventures, and she has had many. She began her career at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which is one of the most iconic uh, research labs in the entire world. She founded Global Ocean Exploration Incorporated, so she gets to share her passion for ocean exploration with the world. She was involved as an expedition biologist for a sub submarine crew with Richard Branson and Fabian Cousteau, broadcasting the Discovery Channel and beyond. She has gone all around the world in pursuit of amazing ocean stories, and I am so excited to share, help share them with you today. Without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Galen, and take us away. Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you for that beautiful introduction. I hope I can keep up your enthusiasm uh, for the entire time. Um, and so I'm just gonna start a screen share and jump right in. And I totally meant that. All right, so let's see, we've got PowerPoint. All right, so here I am with a great white shark. Um, Jesse and I were talking a little bit before. I didn't put a lot of sharks in the presentation. So if anybody has any questions about sharks after, just remember them or like throw them on YouTube for Jesse and he'll throw them my way. So here I am in Guadalupe under the water, my favorite place to be, but that's not where we're gonna start. Oh, let's see, it's not working, there we go. So here I am on top of the Bering Sea. So this is one of my favorite expeditions. We're gonna get to one in a minute, but we're gonna start by showing you this map because I'm an explorer, I love maps. So I've been on expeditions where all those red stars are, but I've also been in expeditions in a lot more places. These are just some of the highlights. Don't worry, we don't have enough time to go all the places, but we're going to hit some of the hot spots. So we're gonna start out in the Antarctic. So down here. So when I was a little girl, I always was fascinated by the Antarctic because it was like this big white blob at the bottom of my globe. And so I was really lucky because I actually started my career working there. So I got to spend two months living on this ship so if we think about it, and I was actually thinking about it now a month ago when we were all sort of locked down and not going anywhere. Like my longest expedition was living on this ship for a little over two months. And now I've been sort of in one place for longer, which for me is really hard because I'm not used to being in one place, right? I'm always on expeditions and I'm always traveling. I'm so lucky to do that, but it's also nice to be in one place. And I remember when I was there, it was great because I could really dive in and really appreciate my surroundings in a different way. So here's the Nathaniel B. Palmer parked in front of Palmer Station, which is one of the US stations down in the Antarctic Peninsula. And that's the Nathaniel B. Palmer icebreaker, which is also a US icebreaker funded by the National Science Foundation. So I started my career there, trial by fire, really big seas, crossing over the bridge, um, you know, working in big seas, really cold, working in sea ice, a totally foreign environment. I was used to the beaches, you know, and like normal stuff. And here I was in a frozen ocean, moving through this solid mass, and I just fell in love with sea ice. I always loved the open ocean, but I fell in love with this solid, massive ocean that we were like moving through, and it was so cool. So I was a low man on the totem pole, which for me was so awesome because I actually got to see and process all of the samples. So I had been working in the lab for months before this expedition. And the cool thing was that now I was actually getting to see all of the critters that I saw dead in formalin and fixed alive. So here I am holding the krill that I had been studying. And here's one swimming around from a picture and a copepod. And so here's a jar of what I was studying. So the basis of the food chain. So we were looking at the whole ecosystem in the Antarctic in a certain spot. Now, this is quite a while ago. So no one had done this work before. So that was even cooler. We were exploring a whole new area of the ocean at a different time of year. So it's super cool. We also got off the ship one day out of the entire expedition. And we got to see things like Adeli penguins and elephant seals and Adeli penguins eat the plankton that I was studying. So we got to look at the whole food chain as we were you know, looking at everything. And it was a big ecosystem project. So I started thinking about the ocean in a very different way and how everything was connected. 
So then I shifted gears. Oh, here I am on the most beautiful day. How could I, that our expedition was the only day that we saw the sun, I think the whole time with huge icebergs everywhere, the southernmost part of our cruise. And I'll never forget that day because it was just so incredibly gorgeous. But then I switched gears. I said, I love the open ocean. I love the sea ice, but you know what I also really love? I really love big fish. So I got to study Atlantic bluefin tuna in graduate school. So I went down to Duke in North Carolina and I got to study what I think is the coolest fish in the ocean. The wide, and why do I think they're the coolest fish? Because they're highly migratory. They go throughout the ocean. Here we are catching one big seas in Nova Scotia. But why do most people care about bluefin? So I care about them for a lot of reasons. First, they're like super cool. They're really fast. But most people care about them because they eat them. So here are some fish in this Japanese market, but they've also been important throughout time. So here, as you can see, they were on some gold coins from ancient Greece. So really interesting. But what were we getting to do? Well, we got to go fishing for these big fish. We use really heavy tackle to bring these fish on board in the most pristine condition that we could because we wanted to learn where they were going in the ocean. Why? Well, because people were killing them at high rates and we needed to understand where they were going and the life history of the fish, where they were spawning, where they were feeding so that we could protect them. So we would catch them, we would bring them on deck. They're really big fish. They get up to over a thousand pounds, these fish. Most of the, this one's probably around 500. So we were mostly tagging fish in the five to 700 pound range, but they get much bigger than that. Here's actually a Pacific bluefin. So what we do is we put little hard drives in them. So we learn all about where they're going in the ocean. And we also put tags on them that talk to satellites. And then we get all where they're going in the ocean from these satellite tags is the best email you'll ever get because you get this email and you get all this data and then you find out where the fish that you tagged months ago has gone. So cool. Once that surgery is done, it takes about three minutes. There's a hose in its mouth. Just like if you were having surgery, you would get oxygen. They, so we do the same thing. We oxygenate its gills, cover its eyes, keep it calm, throw it out the door and it swims away and it collects data about the ocean around it and about where it's going. So these are three of my favorite fish from my data set because fish that were tagged in North Carolina here across the Atlantic Ocean in a matter of weeks. And then the tags popped off sent me this cool email and I got to learn where they were going. Now, one of these fish actually got caught by a Spanish longliner. So it was caught by a fisherman and we got the tag back because we offered a reward to get the tag back. So that fish was actually killed. So out of you know my data set, quite a few were caught by fishermen, proving that we need to understand the fish so that we can keep them in the ocean. So at that time, I was sort of saying, okay, well, there's all these like amazing fish in the ocean and all these scientists doing this great work, but I'm also seeing the declining of these fish. What can I do so that people know that they can have an impact? They need to know and know the problems that we're facing. They need to know what they can do. So I took a step back from academics and right around the same time, I got this fortune cookie and I don't know about you, but I take a lot of advice from fortune cookies and it said real courage is moving forward when the outcome is uncertain. So I had always thought I was going to stay in academics for my entire life. I was going to be a professor. I was going to do this. I was going to do that. But then I found myself saying, I want to tell really cool science stories and I want people to engage in the science. I want to inspire people to care about our ocean. So how do I do that? Well, took a big leap of faith. I sent Christmas cookies to everyone I had worked with and the entire world that, you know, that was in the science field. And well, I ended up in the Arctic on the Bering Sea Ice Expedition. Now, so somebody said, yeah, I would love some help talking about it. Please come and we can run a blog and write about it. And I want you to help us, you know, communicate the science. It happened to be the same people that I was working with in the Antarctic. So it was already plankton that I knew really well. It was already people I had worked with for a long time. And I ended up living on this ship again for over a month because I like spending time at sea. And here it is parked in the ice in the Bering Sea. There's a helicopter, we actually helicoptered onto the ship. You can see some of that footage. I have a whole web series on my website that you can watch, but I don't wanna, there's videos a little choppy sometimes on Zoom. 
Anyway, here's the Bering Sea. Now, why is the Bering Sea so cool? Well, the Bering Sea is one of the coolest ecosystems in the world. It's really important, again, for commercial fisheries. So if you watch Deadliest Catch, you know that king crab are caught up there. If you eat a filet of fish sandwich at McDonald's, all of it is Alaskan pollock, which is caught in the Bering Sea. So really important for your commercial fisheries, but also just a really cool ecosystem. And you can see here, there's this really cool shelf oh, that's about 70 meters deep. So what we did is I flew into Anchorage, Alaska. I then took a tiny plane into St. Paul Island where we then took a helicopter on the ship and we went north. So I've done two expeditions in the Arctic and I'm gonna show you pictures from both in this little section. So one expedition, I lost my little cursor. We went up towards St. Lawrence Island, sampled on the ice and another one I actually got to go through the Bering Strait along the North Slope of Alaska and into the Northwest Passages. So cool to be up there different times of year and just to see this incredible ecosystem. So again, comes back to my obsession with sea ice. I couldn't leave it for too long. I thought I could, and then it just drew me right back in. So here we are in the Northwest Passage on the icebreaker Healy, um, going into some newly forming ice in their fall season. And it was very, very cold. But again, what we were looking at, what we were looking at ecosystems, we were telling the story of how the ecosystem is connected. So we were again, looking at krill and copepods. So the basis of the food chain, and we were looking at the benthos, the bottom of the ocean, doing cores of the mud to see what was settling down there and what was living in it. And really getting a picture of the entire environment, looking at the water column and what was in the water using a CTD rosette. And um, then we got into the ice. So for me, that was the coolest part because I love ice. And so we got farther and farther north into the ice until eventually we could get off the ice, off of the ship, onto the ice. And here I am holding up the ship because I am that strong, you know? And, uh, and then we actually, you know, got to spend a whole day on the ice doing some sampling. And now I'm gonna show you a little video clip, which I hope plays not super choppy um, because Zoom does that, but here we go so you can feel what it's like to go through the ice. We just got in the ice. It's pretty exciting. It was sunny a few minutes ago, but uh, now the clouds came in and it's starting to snow. And uh, we should get into thicker ice later, but it's nice that uh, we first got the ice during the day so we could check it out. Pretty beautiful. You can hear the ice breaking underneath the ship. Pretty amazing. We're in a frozen ocean. And uh, basically what the cruise itself is trying to find out is what's going to happen to the organisms with less ice. So what kind of nutrients are in the water from the melting ice and if it really affects the blooming of the phytoplankton and then in turn the calanus and the copepods and on up to the benthic areas. And it's um, really interesting stuff. There's ice everywhere. We're going through pretty thick ice now, probably about a foot thick, which isn't too thick. There's certainly thicker ice that we've been going through. But right now, I think it's probably about one to two feet thick. And you can really feel it shaking and it makes a lot of noise. I've never been on ice before. I'm very excited. The ship is parked in the ice back here, I'm just kind of like hanging out, and there's uh, lots of signs going on all around us. Oh. We've got these suits on, exposure suits on, they're like a dry suit to keep us warm and just in case the ice breaks for some reason we fall in. But uh, see, feels pretty solid. I think they said it's about 38 centimeters thick, so a little over a foot. 
um, I just ate some. It was um, underneath. It was really um, salty and kind of pond scummy because it's filled with ice algae, which is a really important part of the ecosystem here. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm trying to go tomorrow, you'll know why. <laughs> so, and then you just saw there was a guy watching from polar bears. Don't worry, none came, but if there were, we would have gone back to the ship and it would have been fine, but you know, it was just a, a precaution that they had. Um, so here we are, so we were there, we were clearly doing a lot of important science, cartwheels and you know, tobogganing and uh, made some snow angels, but no, in reality, we were there to take ice cores, to look at the ice algae so that we could understand what was gonna happen when the seasonal sea ice was going to melt. So what was, gonna, what was in the ice, and then that ice algae is really important for the ecosystem because as it melts, it gets food and then the plankton and everything eats it. And then the bigger fish and then it all settles to the bottom and the crab things can eat it as well. So it was really cool to be off the ship. It was my first time on the ice and it was sort of like stream come true. A lot of people were like playing soccer because it was such a gorgeous day. Um, we also had some other ice stations that weren't quite as fun. But if you want to see more of the ice stuff and more of this expedition, there's a, I made a whole web series. So you can watch it. This is a six part series. So you can learn about all of the cool science that happened on this expedition. We also see lots of really cool animals on all of these expeditions. So here are some walruses. Um, I personally had never seen a walrus before this expedition in the wild. And it was just so cool to see them. They were kind of looking at this big red ship as we went by, like what's going on. And uh, it was really cool to get up close with them. So lots of different sea ice. So this is just, you know, like a bergy bit, you know, sort of like hanging out in the ice. This was multi-year ice that had broken off from the sheet. So we're looking a lot at what's gonna happen to, our, to the Arctic and the sea ice and all the animals if there is no sea ice as we're warming. So looking a lot at the problems of climate change or really not so much as the problems of climate change, but what's going to happen with our changing climate. How can we mitigate? How can we understand what's going to happen? Is it going to be all negative? Will some stuff be positive? What just what are the changes? As scientists, we're looking at the changes, we're documenting it, and then we're putting forth that information. So here's just some newly forming ice called pancake ice. I call it scalloped potato ice. I think it's because I'm always really hungry on expeditions. Um, but anyway, I just think it's beautiful. And then some other newly forming ice as well. So now we're going to shift gears and we're going to... We're going to go to Palau. So also, this was an expedition mostly about climate change and what's going to happen to our warming planet and what's going to happen to different ecosystems in our warming planet. But instead of in the Arctic, we're looking at the tropics. So I made a film called Coral Glimmer of Hope. Again, it's available on YouTube on my YouTube channel that you can find if you want to watch the whole thing. But I'm going to show you a little clip and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. Coral is a superorganism. This is the one major ecosystem on the planet that's founded on an animal. There are over 800 species of reef building corals across the globe. All of them have found a remarkable way to exist as the planet's only solar powered animal. How can this be possible? So this was a really cool expedition because I got to take sort of my knowledge about climate and about warming that I knew from the Arctic and then apply it to telling the story of how these corals are surviving in this incredibly diverse environment. So in Palau, there's two sort of reef systems. One's this offshore reef, the typical reef that you would think of when you think of a coral reef. And in Palau, they're still doing really well. But these scientists from three different universities are looking at, from University of Alabama, Birmingham, University of Delaware, and Penn State University, are looking at how corals in these other environments, so these are all healthy corals, they're taking samples, but in this inshore environment that is hot, it's like really hot when you're diving there. It's like bath water, it's so warm where this environment where it's acidic and warm also has this incredible diversity of corals. How can the corals survive in this environment? So they're looking at the microbiology of how, how these corals are surviving to try to understand what coral reefs may look like in our future reefs, in our future oceans. So the good thing is, and why there's a glimmer of hope, is that corals will survive. Not maybe all of the corals, but some of them. So anyway, I just like to tell the story because it's just like another way of looking at climate and it was a really cool expedition. The scientists I worked with are incredible. We got to work in these really cool, beautiful environment with all these outdoor labs. And so they're doing these transplant experiments. You can learn all about it in the film, but just a really incredible environment to work in. So now we're gonna shift gears and we're gonna go to the bottom of the ocean. 
because I got to go in the submarine to the bottom of the blue hole in Belize. Now the blue hole is one of the coolest places on the planet. It's so unique. So Belize is in the Caribbean and essentially what the blue hole is, it was at one time a cave and it was closed off and then was sea level rise 20,000 years ago. And over 20,000 years, it got covered up by the ocean. And then the top collapsed in and it formed this really cool thing called the blue hole. So why is that cool? Well, for so many reasons, but mostly because it's like you're in a cave that would be above water, but it's underwater. So, and not only that, it's really deep. So very few people had been to the bottom. And so we were using these two submarines, the Ida Bell and the Aquatica submarine Stingray to go to the bottom in tandem. And like Jesse was saying, it was for the Discovery Channel. So you can actually watch the whole dive and come on our whole virtual adventure um, on the Discovery Blue Hole Live expedition. And um, I was the biologist for this expedition. So I didn't just have to tell the story. I got to tell the story and do a lot of really fun science. Um, and so you can see that. And then there's another show on Science Channel also about the mystery of the Blue Hole because there's so much mythology about this incredible environment. Cool thing for me was this is the first time I got to go in a submarine. And that was really cool. And I was a little nervous, I have to say. But then once I was down there, I just was like looking around and it was like the coolest thing ever. So here I am about to go on my first sub dive. Um, and now I'm gonna take you sort of on like a little mini sub dive. So as you're going down, you're looking through this porthole. I was shooting a lot of film because I shot a lot of the footage for the Discovery Channel programs. And so we're going down. So as you can see above us, it's light. And in the blue hole, it gets dark really fast. And then we're going down, down, down. And then you can see we're looking up. Diving with two subs is really cool because you can take pictures of the sub and get an image like that. And then from the other sub, like I'm actually in that submarine. How crazy is that, right? And you see these big walls and it gives you the perspective. Because when you're looking through a porthole, you don't have a lot of perspective of what actually the size until you're like more experienced. But for my first time, it was just sort of like a lot to take in. So here we are, you can see how massive the blue hole is inside. We also scuba dove in the blue hole. So this is around 140 feet down. So we're still at recreational level. So this was about the deepest we could go. We got to see all the stalactites that we were seeing in the subs up close and personal, which was neat because you could see all of the encrusting stuff on the stalactites um, and also get a feeling for the scale of how big everything was. We were also using all sorts of really cool technology, not just um, submarines. We were also using ROVs. This is a deep tracker, a really cool little mini ROV that could go down and take pictures into some of the places that we couldn't get as divers um, or in the subs. But here, this is actually from inside the submarine, right? We are going through the stalactite. So I love this video because I remember when we did it, I was like, are you sure this is okay? But we went right through and it was so cool. You could see all of the encrusting animals on the stalactites. And then as you went farther and farther down into the cave, you know, there's not a lot of fish life because it's dark, you know, so it's probably, it was really cool. Um, but as we got farther and farther down, you see less and less life, but we did see this cool hermit crab and he was about that big. He found this like little ledge and he was eating all of the dead stuff that was like coming down. And he was just like the king of his little ledge at around 300 feet. So a really cool animal to have in like a little standoff with the, uh, with the submarine. But as we got to the bottom, as you can see, there's actually a hydrogen sulfide layer. So as you go through that, then there's like almost no oxygen underneath. And so there's nothing alive, or so we thought. But so as we got down to the bottom, it kind of looks like a moonscape. And all it is is like sort of scattered with conch shells. And here's a little video where you can see it's just conch shells everywhere that had either fa had fallen in and then the animal had died because there's no oxygen. Um, it's very interesting chemistry down there. But then we would also see, you know, all sorts of different stuff down there, but mostly like dead conch shells and dead crabs, nothing really alive. Um, but we also saw some human impact. So almost everywhere we go in the ocean, we see human impact. So when we weren't seeing the conch shells, or even when we were seeing the conch shells, we were seeing things like scuba fins. You can see there's a Coke bottle here. We saw Gatorade bottles. We saw all sorts of plastic waste, weight belts. So even in this remote place, there's you know human impact. And we really need to think about what we're putting into the ocean because it's going to stay there, especially with plastic waste in perpetuity. So everywhere I've gone in the ocean, we're seeing, you know, human impact. We see plastic, we see fishing line, we see, you know, all, all kinds of different 
things um, that are human created. Um, so then after you finish the dive, you surface and then you sort of pop up. I like sharing this video because it kind of is like this great feeling, this like burst, you kind of just like bounce on the surface. It was a beautiful sunset. And, um, and then here I am very happy to be out of the submarine post dive. Um, that dive I think was about seven hours. So I was very much in need of some fresh air. And you can see in the background, our tender ship and then the big ship that we were living on for the duration of the expedition. So now I'm just gonna switch gears slightly and go to the, stay in the Caribbean, but we're gonna go to Dominica just to talk briefly about my newest project on sperm whales. I'm making a film about these amazing creatures. I'm not gonna to talk too much about them, but um, I am giving a talk tomorrow for Reach the World all about them. And I know Shangara was doing another talk about sperm whales for you guys for Exploring by the Sea um, Thursday. So tune into either one if you wanna see more sperm whale stuff. But I fell in love with every single whale I was in the water with on this expedition. Um, and I'm telling a really fun story about my connection of when I was a kid with sperm whales because I got to see one when I was a toddler in captivity. Long story, but there's you can watch the trailer on my website. Um, and just, I couldn't not share. These are really my favorite creatures right now. So any other question, we'll take some questions now, but if you want to, you can also visit my website for all, any of the videos, if they did come through a little choppy um, or visit my Instagram at, at Galen Go Explore. So on that note, I'm gonna, I'm going to stop my screen share and go back to Jesse. Fantastic, Galen. What? It's always such a fun time. What great expeditions. Uh, all the videos look really good, but I have linked uh, your website into the YouTube chat bar. So anyone who wants to check that out can all more, like you, this is just a small, tiny little bit of all the stuff that you've done. So everyone can check that out. Uh, if you're on YouTube, share questions in the chat bar. I'll take as many as I can, but I'll start off with a few of my own. Um, you are, are so clearly passionate about all of this. Is there a part of your job that you like the most? Is it the planning for an expedition, actually being out in the water, like diving, anything that jumps out? Um, it's definitely being on the expeditions. <laughs> you know, I think if I didn't enjoy planning them, then it would be, you know, the uh, it would be difficult. But I do enjoy the planning and the logistics and all of that. And then certainly the equipment, I think, is really fun because the technology side and I'm like a gear nerd. Um, but then I have to say, obviously, being in the water, being on the water, getting to go to these really remote places, getting to experience it, not just as a tourist, but actually asking questions and then answering the questions and like try or at least trying to answer using, you know, science is so fun and using getting to use all these instruments. That's definitely the best part. Very cool. There you go. Yeah. You're the first person actually to actually mention instruments and how neat they are. I'm surprised at <laughs> that, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're going to dive back in with diving in a second, but I didn't want to note too, because you didn't get a chance to say it. So few people in human history have been in a submersible ever. Like, I think it's maybe in the 10,000s, but like, maybe not even that, like low thousands. So it's just such a unique experience. So for anyone who's tuning in, um, just know that that's a, a special thing. And I hope you get a chance to learn more and, and check that out. With diving, what kind of diver are you? So we like to highlight here that at 10 years old, you can be on the path to becoming a scuba diver. Um, and when did you get in the water for the first time? What like certification are you at just to share with our guests? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I, um, so when I was younger, you actually had to be 14 to learn how to dive. So they've changed it, which is really exciting. So I got certified when I was 14, actually. Right, I actually took the course before my 14th birthday and I got my card when I was 14. So it was like one of those things that, you know, kind of, you know, so that was, so that was when I started to dive, but I had been snorkeling in, in the water from the time I was basically born. So, you know, I was really lucky that I have parents who love the ocean and they sort of threw me in everywhere we went, we would be snorkeling. So, you know, the first time I was snorkeling, I was, you know, a little kid, you know, in Hawaii because we were on our way home from some crazy adventure. I have very adventurous parents. But I started diving when I was 14. And then really through my high school years is when I did most of my diving education. So, and I'm certified up through Rescue Diver, both Naui and Patty. So in two different um, things. So, you know, I've got like my master diver and then, you know, so a lot of education. And like with my Naui Rescue Diver, I was required to be a lifeguard and then, you know, CPR and first aid through like the Red Cross. And so it was quite extensive training. And you know what? I have to say that I'm really glad that I've had that training because I've had experiences where, you know, like emergency ex emergencies have happened underwater, like someone's out of air. I've actually run out of air on one dive because my regulator was reading that I had 500 pounds of air left 
but I took a breath and it was gone. And all of a sudden I'm at 80 feet and I needed to know how to buddy breathe with somebody. And so, and that happened recently. So after thousands of dives, you know, even being as experienced, like equipment malfunction and you need to know what to do. So I'm really grateful for all of my, um, all of my training that I've had just to get that level of comfort. And then if somebody else has had something. So I think training is paramount. Education with everything is paramount to reduce our risk in these situations. I love that you highlighted that, and especially a personal story. I think a lot of people that come in assume that, you know, this never happens to people that are professional divers. We welcome in a woman named Jill Heinertz. She's uh, oh. one of the elite cave divers in the world. And she, they always ask, are you afraid? And she goes, I'm afraid every single time I go underwater. And that yeah. keeps you focused and prepped and, and yeah, great story. Yeah. Uh, then uh, Victoria in Vancouver wants to know, what is the most interesting or exciting thing you've ever seen underwater? Good luck. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no that's a really hard question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the most interesting thing you've seen in the last year. <laughs> well, so I have to talk about sperm whales because yeah. we got gifted a giant squid tentacle by a sperm whale. No. So it was our last drop of our expedition on sperm whales. And I saw this like long rope like thing coming out of one of the sperm whales mouths. There were five whales coming at us in like a herd. And I was like, is that a rope? Is that fishing gear? Then it dropped out of its mouth. Another whale came, swooped it up in its mouth, brought it up to the surface, spit it out right in front of us. And lo and behold, I was holding a 25 foot long squid tentacle. What? And it was mind blowing. So... That would probably be the coolest thing that I've seen recently. And like sperm whales are amazing to be in the water with. And I think that probably sperm whales are my favorite creature I've ever been in the water with for sure. But I've seen so much cool stuff, but being in the water with a sperm whale is beyond magical. Well, I mean, look at the picture right behind you. So, I mean, for everyone who might, yeah, I mean, we saw a little bit of it in your presentation, but this is just, that is one of the coolest stories when we've had a question like that ever. So that's awesome. <laughs> And, and so to note, because we actually, we've had this brought up a few times lately for whatever reason. So sperm whales are the largest, like large predator whale in the ocean. You know, blue whales and fin whales will eat plankton, but sperm whales eat big things and they eat giant squid as is evidence. Yeah. And so this is like the most titanic battle to happen in the entire animal kingdom by a significant margin. That is so cool. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, yeah, sperm whales are the largest tooth predator, tooth predator on the planet. They've got the largest brains on the planet. They're so smart. And yeah, they're voracious predators of giant squid. I'd love to see that battle down at depth. I, so that would be the coolest thing that I could see ever. We've never, but to my knowledge, that's never been captured on film ever. Nothing like that. And it'd be so hard to, you couldn't plan it. Like it would just be a fluke. You think, I hope one day. Yeah. I mean, if I had tried to wish seeing a giant squid tentacle or thought that that was a possibility, yeah. then it would have, you know, I can't even imagine even wanting, like thinking that that was a possibility, but it happened, so. That's awesome, Jill. How cool is that? Um, okay, you mentioned shifting gears. We're gonna shift gears back to the Arctic. So you highlighted this thing for one slide, a CTD rosette, you called it. So could you explain a little bit about why that's used and what it does, because it's a really funky looking device. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know what? Maybe I'm gonna screen share again and so that I can like kind of point out what it is. Does that work for you? That was perfect. Okay, so let me get it. Do -do -do -do. Uh, do -do. Here we go. Um, all right, so here we've got the CTV. So basically what this is is, the reason it's a rosette is because it's round and there's bottles all around it that are opened and closed at various steps so that you can take water samples at the various steps. So it'll go all the way down and then you'll open and close these bottles. You'll open, you'll, they're all open, and then you'll close them at the different depths to collect the water. You'll open and close them to collect the water at the different depths. So then you get a complete picture of the water profile. You can get the animals. But the CTD is actually this at the bottom, which is a conductivity depth temperature sensor. And what that does is it takes all of these complicated measurements of the water so that you get, you know, you can figure out the, where the thermocline is, so where the temperature break is, where the salinity break is, and all of that. So essentially, this instrument will give us an entire picture of the profile of the water column. And then corresponding to that profile, you'll take water samples that then you can get, learn more about the, um, the chemistry and things like that about 
the various depths to get like, to learn all about the, you know, oceanography, the physical aspects. You can also get microplankton in, in these bottles. So actually in the Antarctic, we were studying microplankton. So diatoms, cyanoflagellates, radiolarians, things like that in those water samples. So we would take stuff, we'd spin it down, and then we would look at uh, the slides of the microscopes to know what the microplankton was as well. Nice. Yeah. I encourage everyone as a follow-up to this to look up microplankton uh, online. Some of the most beautiful science photography and art has ever been done on them. They're like some of the weirdest, coolest animals in the, on earth. Um, yeah, very cool. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. And also make sure to check out radiolarians because they are some like, they are mind-blowingly beautiful. They are. So I'll type that in the chat bar just in case people have a hard time spelling it. So radiolarians, I'll put that in, in two seconds. Um, so you're on these ships, you're on these ships for a month. What is it like? What's your day by day on the ship? What are you eating? Where are you sleeping? What's going on? <laughs> so different ships are very different. You know, there's like so many different types of research vessels. There's really big research vessels, which I highlighted on in this ex in this presentation. So you've got like the Nathaniel P. Palmer, the icebreaker that was in the Antarctic. Then you've got the Healy, the U.S. Coast Guard icebreaker um, that I was on in the Arctic. So both of those are really big ships. So the Palmer is over 300 feet and the Healy is over 400 feet. So you're, it's basically like a little floating island, right? But so you've got your you've got your cabin that you're sharing usually with between one or two people. And then you usually have like a shared bathroom and it's pretty much, you know, not comfortable, but it's like dorm style living. Um, it's not uncomfortable at all. Um, you know, you probably would like the people you're sharing the bathroom with because it's a lot of people to be a little cleaner. But other than that, you can't really complain so much. Um, but then you've got, you know, you've, you've got your food issue. Um, and so anyway, so for me, one of the biggest things, I actually wrote a blog post about this a while ago, um, is that when you're on these ships, you have like these big metal doors, it's like open and close. And I remember I'm five foot two and I'm quite petite. So for me, like opening and closing those metal doors is quite the workout, especially carrying camera gear and things. So I always find that you have to keep them closed because if for some reason something happens, you know, you want to make sure that the, um, that, you know, nothing will flood. So you have to dog all of the doors. So those are like the big research vessels. And then you're, there's a cook that, you know, makes all of your food in the galley. You eat meals together. They're usually four meals a day. So breakfast, lunch, dinner, and mid rots, which is, you know, a midnight ration, rations, basically. So it's kind of like, because people are working 24 hours on the boats in general, right? So you've got either, you've got your different shifts. So people need to eat at different times. So, um, and what do you eat? Well, it really depends, but usually it's a lot of fried food. It's not very good. I always bring a lot of snacks. I eat a lot of tater tots. I'm a vegetarian, so that's always been a challenge, especially earlier on in my career. Now I think it's better because more and more people are vegetarian. Um, and then I've worked on some smaller vessels that are really, you know, comfortable and luxurious. And I've worked on a lot of fishing vessels. So, you know, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say luxurious. I mean, not like a cruise ship at, by any means, but like, it's all relative. Um, but, you know, some of them are, you know, it's, it's usually pretty tight quarters, but it's all pretty fun. It is, you sound like it's pretty, I mean, again, your enthusiasm <laughs> is infectious and I love it. I mean, you have um, to love it. <laughs> so. Pretty cool gig. I love that picture. I mean, again, you said it wasn't even all your expeditions, but all the red stars. People can check that out on YouTube later. Like, that's a lot of amazing places. We barely scratched the surface today. Um, so amazingly, we're getting near the end of the session. So I want to uh, share a few more questions before we wrap up. One of which is, you know, you've been doing this for so long now. What are the changes that you've seen personally? So, like, we, we talked about climate change a little bit, whether it's ice sheet, you know, changes or water warming up in tropics. Like, what have you seen personally? Yeah. Um, so. First off, when we saw the picture of me standing on the ice holding up the ship, this time of year in the past few years, that has not iced over again. So that sea ice is no longer there. So there is definitely less seasonal sea ice than we've seen in the past. So that's always unfortunate because it is such an important part of the ecosystem. I've certainly seen fish decline, which is very depressing. Um, but then there's also positive stories about fish and fisheries. So we were, I was watching bluefin rapidly decline when I was in graduate school. And then we sort of saw them, you know, now they're doing a little bit better, which is great. Atlantic bluefin, not all bluefin species, but Atlantic bluefin, we have seen a little bit of an uptick, very minor, but it's still better than the precipitous decline towards, you know, extinction that we were witnessing back when I started that work. Um, 
So that's a good thing. But yeah, and I think in general, you know, we're losing a lot of corals, we're losing a lot of reefs, we're losing, you know, and just different changes. You know, we're seeing tropical fish in northern waters. You know, if I go out my my backyard here and I you know, I can see a lionfish, I shouldn't see a lionfish. I mean, we shouldn't see lionfish around here anyway because they're an invasive species. So that's the other thing is we're getting more and more invasive species and they're now expanding more because our waters are warmer. So there's so many changes. Um, yeah. I haven't seen any positive changes so much other than like some slight upticks from good conservation measures. But um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, I like that. That's about, you know, it, it is. There's a lot of threats facing ocean wildlife, wildlife around the world right now, ecosystems in general. But those local conservation efforts do make a huge difference. And I, I want to you know, sort of segue that into this idea of, you know, with all these challenges, people that are at home that are watching right now what are some things that they can do they can leave this broadcast they've been inspired by the ocean what can they do to help conserve these ecosystems and species yeah no absolutely i think it's really important to take a stake in everything that you do because i mean it's really not there's not one single thing that you can do that's going to have a huge impact it's really about thinking about everything that you do and making you know making slight changes now I say that and i know it's really difficult so what's the one thing that if you do right now stop using single use plastics because plastic is a huge problem in the ocean and every single piece of plastic that is consumed ends up you know if it gets recycled it's still not the end of life you know it's still gonna it needs we also have microfibers so there's so many problems with plastics because they're just and there's important uses to plastics too and important uses for single some single use plastic but never use a grocery bag that's not a reusable grocery bag you know, bring a produce bag that you can use like a mesh bag. Don't get the plastic produce bags. Now it's a little bit more difficult with the pandemic that we have because a lot of stores are changing, which makes no sense because you can come home. Well, I mean, what I've been doing personally is I come home with my bags from the grocery store. I empty them. I put them straight in the washing machine and then they're clean when I go back to the grocery store. So it's all contained. And fortunately, I, I live in a place where they're fine with that. But so I would say definitely no single use. Um, grocery bags as much as you can, anything that you can do that's reusable, better. Um, and that's really the thing that you can do pretty easily, you know, and then like plastic wraps, use like the beeswax wraps and stuff like that. They work better anyway, so. I love, this is a message and it's something, I mean, we spend the entire month of September highlighting ocean plastics because what's great about it to me is that it's an issue that's totally apolitical. No one looks at a bunch of plastic on a beach and goes, great, right? Like we all hate it. We all recognize it's a problem and we can all really do something big to help it out. So that's huge. Um, yeah. National Geographic actually has this whole campaign planet or plastic right now. So anyone online can check that out between magazines, online, great recommendations, tips and things you can do. Uh, but Galen, this is a great yeah. start. Hopefully yeah, the know. other thing is never release a balloon. Yeah. <laughs> that's the other thing that's a huge, I mean, I don't think I can remember the last time that I've been out on a boat that I haven't seen a balloon floating in the ocean or a beach where I haven't seen a balloon washed up. So don't release balloons. If you have them, if you insist on having them, make sure that they are disposed of properly and not out in the environment. Fantastic. So stuff we can leave with. Uh, which is amazing. Uh, Gillen, we really appreciate you being here with us for Oceans Week. Thank you so, so much. And uh, when are these other presentations you're doing? So I know you mentioned Reach the World. Do you, when is that tonight? Uh, the Reach the World one is tomorrow at noon. Well, and it will also be accessible, I think, through the Explorers Club website or Reach the World website. Um, and then I'm also on a panel for the UN Sustainable Development Goals, Ocean about technology and innovation for oceans and ocean conservation tomorrow afternoon at 2.30. So that's more for the parents out there, probably, because it's um, a little, but it's a great panel. Fabien Cousteau is on it, Susie Mai, um, Jeremy McCain, and it's a really great Francois Ballet, a really amazing group of panelists. Um, and then there's also a really cool virtual hub put together by the Peace Boat on Friday, where it's like a virtual conference center that you can actually create an avatar and walk through and see art and films. So a few of my films will be screening in their digital space. So fantastic. Well, people can check that out. They can check out your social media on your website as well. So I encourage them to do so. Um, thank you so much, Deborah, for tuning in on YouTube. And, and Galen, thanks again for joining us. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me and happy World Oceans Week. Happy World Oceans Week. Bye for now, everyone.